in order that we uh, might remember and uh, buy their products, um, companies often brand themselves um, by establishing a company logo. Um, and I want to look at a few logos this morning from different companies and see how well they're doing, to see, see if you guys can guess uh, whose company these logos belong to. So go ahead and show me the first slide there. Whose logo is that? Pepsi. Pepsi. All right. Pepsi's done a pretty good job of finding a, a logo and branding their product, haven't they? Let's see the next one. Who would that be? Apple. Who? Apple. Apple. And they make what? Everything, yeah. Every, seems like that, doesn't it? Phones and computers and so forth. All right, very good. Next one. Who's that? NBC. NBC. That's right. The, 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 the peacock. Right, yeah. Okay, the next one. Who's that? Starbucks. Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Even the little guy here knows Starbucks. All right, they, they make very expensive coffees, don't they? Yes, they do. Next. Who's that? Anybody remember that one? Very good. Procter and Gamble. Yeah, remember there was a big controversy about that if this was like some kind of satanic symbol or something. Remember that back 20 years ago? Next one. Who's that? Twitter. That's right. Okay. One more. Who's that? DreamWorks. Wow, I thought that would be harder than that. Yeah, I thought that would be harder. And let's see, what's the next one? What's that? Christian. Yeah, that's the Christian logo, isn't it? Now, I want you to think about the logos that we saw before this one. Um, what? I don't want you to think so much about what they had in common. I want you to think about what does this? How does this logo differ from the logos that came before? It's for everyone. This one is for everyone. Okay, that's a good point. Another one back there. It's not selling something, huh? Or as, actually there was a salesman in one of my congregations uh, came up to me one time and he said, Pastor, he said, uh, you're a salesman just like me. You're just selling the mother of all products. So, yes. It's forever. it's forever. Okay. Very good. What else? Yeah, very good. That's really the point I was kind of hoping someone would bring up. Look how this logo differs from the other logos. The others were flashy, um, they were clever, um, they were upbeat. This is a cross. And think about the cross. What, what is the cross? You know, it's, a, it's a, a symbol that's drab. You know, it's, it's brown in color usually when, it's, when we, we show it. And uh, sometimes I think we're so ashamed of it in the church, we try to dress it up. You know, we, we, we put gold or silver on it and and try to make it a, a beautiful thing, but really it's not. I mean, it was a, uh, the cross represents a heinous punishment for dis civil disobedience in the Roman Empire. And I'm sure that marketing consultants of today would cringe at the suggestion that the cross is a winning logo for any organization. And, uh, and I know that, I'm sure down through history that that many people have said, maybe we ought to get rid of the cross. Maybe we, that shouldn't be the symbol of the church. But yet, you know, there it is. The cross is the logo of Christ's church on earth, and it has been for 2,000 years. And as someone said here, it will be forever. It's the central symbol. It's the only symbol, really, of our church. Over this past month, I've hosted several uh, First Communion training classes for our four youth who will be communing here today and uh, one of the things that, that I asked them to do is to come and sit in the front pew here of the church and just look around and find as many crosses as they can and I want to encourage you to do that here this morning um, and I'm just going to point some of them out you'll notice our pyramids on the lecture and the pulpit and the altar all are adored with crosses aren't they we have the big cross up top of course our banner has a cross the christian flag has a cross on it and the christian flag pole has a cross on it doesn't it look at the lamps up there they have crosses on them don't they um we have the processional cross uh, we have little crosses here if you've ever noticed that up here on our sink on our uh, altar rails 
And how about the pews? Have you ever noticed the crosses on either end of the pews? And look at your hymnal. There's a cross on the hymnal, isn't there? You see that? There's a cross on my stole here this morning. And I just noticed I'm not even wearing my, my wood cross this morning. Look at the windows. They're in the shape of a cross, aren't they? And finally, think about your church. Notice the shape of your church here this morning. You've got the long vertical pole here and the horizontal pole here. Every time I point that out to the kids, they're like, oh, wow, I never noticed that. So the cross is, you know, the, the architecture of the church incorporates the cross because the cross is the symbol, the, the, the central logo of the church. It's really what the church is about. If it wasn't for the cross, we would not be here this morning. It is the only symbol of the church. And of course, it's the only symbol of our, of our service of, of Holy Communion that we'll be celebrating here in just a few minutes. You know, that's what it's all about. It, it, communion reminds us, doesn't it, that Jesus did what? He went to the cross and gave his body that we might have life. His blood was shed that we might have eternal life and forgiveness in his name. Why do we do that? Why is the cross so important? Well, it, it speaks the truth. It speaks the truth about God and, and God's infinite, unconditional, all-encompassing love that will forever be preserved and proclaimed to all people in every generation both Holy Communion and the symbol of the cross remind us that He died that we should have life in His name. So what does the cross have to do with Christ the King Sunday? Well, I want to suggest to you that it has everything to do with Christ the King Sunday. Look closely at our gospel lesson today from, from the Apostle Luke. You know, we took that little, little bit out of the crucifixion story, didn't we? Through the whole ordeal of the crucifixion, Jesus refuses to hate the people who are crucifying him. He says those famous words, doesn't he? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And yet the world mocks him. You said you were God's anointed king, Jesus. Come down off that cross and save yourself. And the Romans, with searing sarcasm, nailed that sign above his head, didn't they, that said, the king of the Jews. I mean, they didn't, they meant the exact opposite, right? They, they didn't, that, they didn't want you to take that sign literally. That was just a sign dripping with irony and sarcasm. He's not a king. He's just a dead Jew hanging on a cross, they said. And of course, we know how the Jews really felt about Jesus. Uh, in the Gospel of John, they tell Pontius Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. They rejected Jesus as king as did the Romans, and the whole world, for that matter. But isn't it interesting how that sarcasm, they, they thought they were being so clever, and yet in the final analysis, it wasn't sarcasm at all, was it? He really, truly was the king. Not just the king of the Jews, but the king of all people, the king of the universe, God's anointed king. Jesus is the king who rules from the cross, not with weapons or armies or brute force or violence, but with grace and love and mercy and forgiveness and the power to raise the dead to life. Jesus is a king like no other. The only king to truly rule by divine right. Do you, do you realize that? All other kings used to claim that, right? Oh, I rule by divine right. I'm, I'm, I have my authority from God, but none of them really did. The only king who had divine right was Jesus. God the Father gave him the authority to rule over all of us. And he chose not to rule with the right hand of power, but with the left hand of love. Jesus is the king who rules from the cross. And that's why we hang it everywhere. This morning I want to conclude with just a, a couple um, quotes that I ran across in my research here this week for this sermon. Um, 
I think they sum it up pretty well. The first one is, is from an old seminary professor of mine, Dr. Eric Rich, a, a Luther scholar at, at uh, used to be at Gettysburg Seminary. He's retired now. He wrote the following. He says, The way of the serpent always seems more attractive than the way of Christ. Think about that. The way of the serpent, you know, the way of sin, the way of, uh, the way of power, you know, of, of uh, you know, getting your way, insisting on your way, that's, that's, that's the way of the serpent. It always seems easier, doesn't it? It's always easier to just go out and grab what you want. Rather than the more attractive way of the Christ, you know, the, the Christ who went to the cross, rather than to deny the truth. And the second quote I want to share with you this morning is from Martin Luther. He wrote the following, he said, Beware of aspiring to such purity that you will wish not to be looked upon as a sinner. Let me read that again. Beware of aspiring to such purity that you will wish not to be looked upon as a sinner. For Christ dwells only in sinners. On this account, Christ descended from heaven where he dwelt among the righteous in order that he might dwell with sinners. Now think about that. Christ left heaven where he was with the angels who just live in, in absolute purity. So he could come down and be with us, we who struggle with what it means to be righteous, we who fail at every turn in our lives. We are a bunch of sinners, and yet Christ wants to eat with us today. What an awesome king we serve. In Jesus' name, amen.